I'm thinking about resurrecting uh, my old show, Warren Blythe's Funeral, from back when I was in college. As one of these annoying video blogs, but not annoying, fantastic, ooh. <clears throat> Mostly I just want to get uh, comfortable being on camera again. Uh, today at work I was asked to talk about VR, which I, I love talking about VR, and uh, it didn't go well, so now I'm on camera. Uh, the idea of the show, kind of, is I'd like to just start doing video diaries for the different things I'm working on at Solid Fuel Studios, and so maybe I'll just record this tonight off the cuff, take a slurp, and um, get comfy, see how this works. I'm an old, kind of fat, white guy, so this may not go well, but <clears throat> practice for me. You don't have to watch, but if you have any ideas, feel free to leave comments. Be brutal. Um, love it. I predict that one or two of my friends will watch part of this video. So, thank you guys. So, I'm checking my script notes over on this screen. So, here's a segment called What's Coming This Week. In theory, I just want to talk about what I'm going to do for the next week. Um, tomorrow's big team meeting at work. That's boring, but my boss told me I could talk about VR, and I should talk about VR. And then his boss sent out the agenda for the meeting. And there was no place where I would be talking about VR. So I don't know what's happening. It's going to be exciting. Um, for me, this weekend, I don't know. Tempted to sneak off to theaters and see Batman v Superman again so I can finish forming oh, nerdy rage thoughts about it. It was probably a waste of money. And so, um, I don't know, maybe see Keanu. Maybe see um, The Jungle Book. Maybe wait and uh, seek childcare with the wife so we can go see the, uh, the new Marvel movie. Captain America sequel, sequel whatever, sequel number two. Sequel number, everyone's in it, and the special effects cost more, um, which is coming out in like next week, next Friday. Hmm. Um, but point is no real plans. Hopefully I'll have some concrete plans, and this will shame me into planning more distinctly. Had plans a lot over the years, but not right now. Um, yeah, I don't know. Hmm, that would make more sense if there were a lot of people doing shows on my channel and I was telling you what they're all going to do this week, so I don't know if that'll be a segment that comes back. New segment, talking about tech. <laughs> there he is, I'm talking about VR right now. Um, wearing my Meta shirt. This is some retired logo from some company that does uh, augmented reality stuff. I don't know, the big thing for me today was I got really hyped on this idea that VR is teleportation. Um, nobody knows what I'm talking about. There's a thing I've noticed with technology, when you want to talk about it with people, where we don't have the vocabulary, we don't have the words to, uh, to describe it. We can just say, it's weird, and you know, it's cool, and nobody knows what you're saying because they're so vague. So I kind of like to slip in the idea of pick some concept we're all familiar with. And so, in this case, VR is teleportation. So when somebody is talking to you about VR, it's like a mind experiment. Um, just substitute the word teleportation. So if someone says, geez, that VR just costs too much. Well, that teleportation costs a lot, doesn't it? Yeah. I don't care. It's teleportation. It's thrilling. Um, so, for example, geez, VR is so isolating. It cuts you off from your family and your friends, and you're just wearing this weird box on your face, and so isolating. Kind of like teleportation. It's so isolating, isn't it? Yeah. You're away from everybody. Geez. I don't care, because it's teleportation. Um, and, in theory, you know, the solution to that teleportation problem, isolating you from friends and family, is they should also teleport with you to wherever you went. Um, why should we all hang out in my boring house here in Albany when we could all hang out on Mars together? That would be cool as a family. Um, so I don't buy the idea that VR is awful and going to destroy us all any more than I buy the idea that teleportation is boring or somehow going to destroy us all. So that's my talking about tech. Not very technical, is it? Um, I don't know. This ties into an old idea that I maybe should save for another show. But there'll ever be another show... That whole thought process started with Twitter. A lot of people complaining that Twitter is worthless. It's 140 characters, you can't say anything. But to me, Twitter is telepathy. Um, Twitter is a communication medium that forces you to not really rant or think about it, and it starts tricking you into just spitting out whatever's on your mind. Just sending these rockets out. And um, what's cool about that is if everyone on Twitter is just firing them off, uh, then everybody else on Twitter can just suck them up. And so... Twitter ends up being this thing where you can just kind of know what people are thinking all over the world, uh, randomly. A lot of social media is like that. But it's interesting to me that 
We dream of flying, well, we have flying. We might dream of telepathy, we kind of have telepathy. And we might dream of teleportation, and now we got that with VR. So, it's not exactly what we've dreamed about, but neither, we don't fly like we dreamed about. Flying is still pretty cool. Um, and it's a way to think about it, and it's a way to uh, steal yourself when people shit all over it. Yeah. Um, and resist their negative energies. Maybe. So, um, I don't know. New segment, book remarks. Um, what am I reading right now? Not a whole hell of a lot. I dug a bunch of books off the shelf. Really? Just finished reading The Walking Dead. <clears throat> what is this? I read 152 and 153. And, I don't know, it's weird talking about comics, but hopefully this will shame me into reading more real books and talking about them. Got a lot of pressure to read Ready Player One ASAP. So, hopefully... Uh, I will go buy a copy or go to the library and get one of those free guys. Um, the Walking Dead, what can I say? As a comic, and nobody's reading it. Nobody I know reads the comics or watches the show. Um, one guy, my boss, but we don't talk about TV shows. Anyway, there's a formula to this. Robert Kirkman has down, or every episode or every comic issue. There's a lot of talking. There's at least one or two good character scenes, and there's kind of one big gross-out or one big action event. And, uh... And I was like, who cares what's happening in the comic? I'm trying to think of something unique to my perspective on reading it, but... I'm psyched that Negan is back. It's weird that Negan is out in the comic while he just got out in the show. It's cool how the last issue, they very specifically called out ideas. Actually, it was the issue before that. They said in the letters column, Negan is never getting out of that cell. You can take that to the bank. Next issue, Negan gets out of his cell. So, there's a weird fun to reading letters columns that few people do. I don't know how many... People I know read comics, much less, you know, maybe they buy graphic novels. They don't actually buy monthly issues anymore. Anyway, Walking Dead's like the only comic I can reliably buy every month and feel satisfied by every month. Um, I'll often walk through the store and buy something else. That's horrible. Like, who cares about, you know. Also, I'll stare at paint while it dries. So, I'm glad we could share that together. Next week, I'll hopefully read another book. I got this Walking Dead Rise of the, the Governor to tackle. I'm not excited, but I bought it. And I have this old George R. R. Martin's World of Ice and Fire. <laughs> Almost certainly finished reading this bad boy. <clears throat> so close. So close. Um, which is a rad book. Or here, I found my parents' old copy of Grimm's Fairy Tales. And this was stories that were read to me when I was a kid, so I'm excited to read these to my kids. Um, anyway. I don't know, books. Um, I watch a lot of movies, so... I like to talk to people at work about the movies, and uh, I don't know if they care. Uh, but they're polite, and they tolerate it. My wife is also very polite. She tolerates my movie rants and my TV show rants. So maybe the this video will be a way for me to get that out. Maybe some dude in Omaha will watch him, and we can become bros. Um, I watched uh, 300 Rise of an Empire. I got it from Amazon. I got it from Amazon because I got it from Netflix. Um... I still pay for discs to come in the mail from Netflix. Also, like nobody that I know. So, uh, a lot of Batman v Superman controversy. I've had a lot of arguments about the idea that Zack Snyder might have actually been competent. I think he might know what he's doing. He might be trying to make a kind of movie that people aren't ready to consume. Um, anyway, I was curious if he actually knows what he's doing or if he's out of his mind. And it occurred, I looked through his little IMDb page and saw that he wrote the sequel to 300. I mean, he wrote and directed 300, I don't know. So he just wrote the sequel, somebody else directed it. I thought, you know what, I should watch that. I kind of assumed it was a straight-to-video trash cash-in, but he wrote it. So let's see what's going on. Let's see if there's any genius in that script. And sadly, I still don't know. Um, I love Sucker Punch. Love it. Might be my top five movies of all time. It's a big movie for me, and I think a lot of people don't understand it. Um, so I love him for that. So I tend to give him the benefit of the doubt that maybe he is deeply philosophical, despite coming off like a frat guy in his interviews. I think he's damn smart. And perverted and interesting. So I watched this weird movie, um, 300 Rise of an Empire. It's inspired by Frank Miller's comic Xerxes, which is the official sequel to his comic 300. Frank Miller, is, as we all know, has become a, a character. As he's gotten old. So, um, so here's Zack Snyder's adaptation. I don't know if the smart bits were from the comic or from Zack Snyder, but there are definitely smart 
bits and some very interesting moments of dialogue and some thoughts and some battle scenes. Really creative uh, bits of business. Uh, and like every other Zack Snyder movie, even though he just wrote this one, there are some really dumb parts. There is at least one part that makes you just makes your jaw drop, makes your jaw go loose, and you can't speak anymore, like right now, because it is so bad and so ill-informed. It's like the moment in Man of Steel where uh, Superman and Lois finally kiss, but they're covered in the ashes of the thousands of dead people. That's a weird moment. You're like, this is maybe it looked good on the page, but why would you shoot it like this? This is not because you'd have cut this out in the movie. Are you doing this on purpose because you're a rebel? Or uh, are you making a comment about how these moments are obligatory and shouldn't be there? I don't know. <clears throat> um, so 300 Rise of an Empire has that moment. Uh, it's, in theory, historical drama. I guess that's pushing it. But um, this the good guy from Athens is kicking ass against the Persian pirate queen. Uh, not queen, but witch. I don't know. Pirate kick-ass captain. And... Um, He's thwarting her so bad that she sends out some secret messengers in the night so they can have a secret mm, get up, secret get up. They can have a secret meeting. Uh, when this when this kind of scene happens in any historical movie, uh, I will because uh, you know this is something that no history book ever mentioned. That's why it has to happen in secret where there's few witnesses so that we can just pretend. Uh, it isn't Braveheart, you know, like the weird sweaty Scottish rebel meets with the Queen of England and they just have sex, you know. Sure enough, that's the point of this scene. Um, the two military leaders on the opposite sides of a war where hundreds are dying meet in secret to talk about should one of them back down or maybe give up. And uh, it comes out that the guy from Greece just hates this Persian lady from Greece so much. Hates her so much that he just thinks about her. Oh, and they just start fucking, they just start going for it. They just start going at it, having the sex. And uh, it just really caught me off guard, my jaw dropped, because this is so wrong. On some level, maybe it's so wrong that it's kind of awesome. Um, we could use war, more war movies where the uh, generals meet up and just start just having sex because they're just so obsessed with each other. It would be kind of rad if it was two dudes, I feel like, or two ladies, because um, nah, it was two dudes, because you play into that whole macho thing. There's a big macho vibe, of course, to the 300 movies. Um... But it wasn't. It was the hot chick, Eva Gardner. And uh, so she gets naked a lot and has sex a lot. I don't know. It was, so it was a weird scene. You're just kind of like, why is this happening? Is this... I guess the all the trucker bros that are watching this wanted um, some sex, and here we go. It's the most unlikely people to be having sex. Weird. And then it just totally thwarts itself, and in the middle of all their sex, and uh, they decide, no, they still hate each other, and they're going to fight, and they just stop oh, what? And to spoil the end of the movie, it also just kind of ends, and there's kind of a, what? kind of moment. So, anyway, not not a total waste of time. Um, the first 300 movie, I didn't get a hefty gay calendar vibe. Nothing wrong with gay calendars, but I got a hefty gay caliber calendar vibe off this one. And I think it's because in the first movie, all the dudes are hanging out with their banana slings and their rock-hard abs, but they're talking about how they're all going to go die together as brothers, so it feels very macho. Like, yeah, bro, slap me. This time, they're not that badass. They're just a bunch of dudes from Athens who are, like, hanging out on a beach, just kind of leaning on their poles. And it just felt more like, okay, yeah, weird. Uh, this kind of, I guess this is pretty sexy. Different vibe. I don't know. So, weird movie. I don't know, I guess that came out negative, so I suck, but I'll work on that. Uh, I didn't mean it to be negative, I just meant to say it just feels different than the first movie. Uh, I think produced by his, uh, Snyder's new production company, Cruel and Unusual Punishment. I'll check that, and if it's not true, I'll cut it out. Um, great name for production company, Cruel and Unusual Punishment. So, I think the jury's still out on Zack Snyder. He might be totally rad. I uh, wish more people would give him a chance. Anyway, I don't know, also watched Mad Max Fury Road, just for the hell of it again. The first time I saw it, I was literally so sick that I had to go back to sleep every couple hours. And we timed it, so I woke up, and we stumbled to the car, and I went opening weekend to Mad Max Fury Road and put on the 3D glasses, and oh shit, the movie just pissed all over my face, kicked me in the nuts. And I was like, oh god, that was way better than I thought, but I, uh, I'm kind of sick, and then I went back to sleep. And I hadn't seen it since. And so everybody telling me about how it was the greatest movie last year, just kind of was like, yeah, it kind of hurt me, actually. So... It's nice to see it again and confirm, like, yeah, it's a fucking amazing movie. Um, I don't know, and just takeaways, I was really struck 
by the amount of nonverbal storytelling. There's a bit where Max is strapped to the front of a car and they spin it around to fight a car with a buzzsaw that's cutting up some other giant supercar truck. And it misses and it goes right past Max who ducks and it cuts the poles over his head which have little skulls on them like they look rad. The skulls tumble under the car, exploding, actually under, under a spike car as I recall, exploding because there are actually grenades inside the skulls on the poles behind him and that blows up this car and it's just like the level of like whoa 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 it's just amazing no verbal no just no explanation nobody's like i see what happened there there were grenades in those skulls it's just the kind of detail you might be like geez i don't know things are blowing up <clears throat> but that's part of what's right about that movie not a lot of dialogue but it still feels extremely well written very carefully thought out every little piece i don't know i probably watch other movies i love talking about movies but that's all I can think of. On deck this week is uh, Victor Frankenstein. Just got that. My new disc from Netflix. And uh, written by Max Landis, who I'm fascinated by. Uh, he did this great uh, Death of Superman video on YouTube. I hope everybody watches. If you have any tolerance for Superman. Whoa! Max Landis, of course, the son of famous John Landis. Uh, brilliant, beloved filmmaker. He wrote this movie Chronicle, I think it was called. Hey, dear. So on deck is Victor Frankenstein, written by Max Landis. Um, Max Landis got a lot of cool stuff to say about movies. I really enjoyed his appearance on Half in a Bag from uh, the boys I respect out at Red Letter Media in Milwaukee. Um, interesting guy. Um, so anyway, um, I don't know. I feel like I should make a prediction uh, about a movie I know I'm going to watch to see. You know, you got to set goals and see if you meet them. You got to make predictions and see if you were right or wrong to tell if you should uh, stop making predictions. I don't know. I vaguely recall enjoying the trailer, and uh, I don't know. Great actors. I'm sure it'll be well good enough of a movie that it won't be like, ugh, what a waste of time. Could be, could be great. Um, could be a genuine different perspective on this classic myth. I love the Frankenstein novel by Mary Shelley. Um, so, hmm. Excited. Anyway, I predict it'll have some weird choices, though. And it'll feel odd, probably because they made some big compromise due to lack of money. And I'll be like, ah, well, maybe there was a reason that part sucked. Let's see. So, TV shit. TV tropes. TV segments. Commercial break. Televisual telenovels. Um, telling. TV tellings. Telling TV. Icarus, slightly visible. That's cool, I guess. <clears throat> I don't know. It feels weird talking about TV because um, I remember once meeting with some friend of my mom's, who um, old lady, and stays at home all day. I asked her. Uh, I was trying to start a conversation. I said, uh, "What do you What are you doing for fun? Usually, I try to like figure out what people want to talk about themselves. So I was kind of like, "What do you do all day, old retired lady?" Thinking she must have some craft. She must have some pursuit. You know, maybe she fights crime, and her response was just to list off all the shows that she watched and all the times. And that was her life. She is um, staying alive, clinging to life, so that she can watch a bunch of soap operas. And it made me super sad. But that was years ago, and now TV is really good. And or I'm old and sad, so I watched a lot of TV. Um, so here's a segment about TV. Really good episode of Agents of Shield. I should have looked up who wrote it because it might be the first good episode of season three. Um, it really felt like it was written for adults, and not some kind of weird CW show knockoff or shit. Um, anyway, I don't know, this is the one where they go to a transhuman bar where all the drinks are underlit with neon trays, and it felt like something out of a dollhouse to me. Just kind of a cool, left-field attempt at super sci-fi cyberpunk stuff that was really out of place, really, in the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. world. But thank you, I loved it. Um... I don't know. What else? Games of Thrones is back. Game of Thrones is back. First episode aired. Um, and it was mostly like a, here's, remember this kind of episode. Um, but I remember, I really, I really liked it. And I liked it a lot more than the first episode of last season. Where um, Jon Snow like shot an arrow into the King of the Wildlings. That whole, that's the only part of that episode that had any oomph. The rest of that episode, I remember, was really like a, oh... Well, I guess the show's back. Maybe it'll get better. 
this time I was really just hyped. It was like, remember all this cool shit that's happening everywhere? It's all pretty rad, right? Mm, get ready. Um, anyway, whatever. Uh, what else? Fear the Walking Dead. I love Fear the Walking Dead, and it's hard to describe to people because I'm always like, God, oh, it was so good, let me tell you about it. They were on a boat, and, um, I don't know, they, uh, you know, killed a zombie, of course, and, uh, there's families. Jeez, this kid hates his dad. And you're like, God damn it, does, how am I not conveying how rad this show is? I think what's secretly rad about that show is that the music is really good. Um, like, you don't talk about that, but it's Atticus Ross, and uh, I wonder if Trent Reznor is contributing, and they're just not putting it in the credits, but maybe it's just that Atticus Ross is rad, but uh, damn, the music is really good on that show, and um, so is the acting, so maybe they could just sit around on the deck tanning, um, and it would still be a great show, because it's really good. Anyway, um, whatever, TV. Hmm. <clears throat> Let's see. Segment. Working titles. Hmm? The idea is, uh, I'll try to pick something I'm going to work on this week and then check in and see how well I did. I'm going to work on a webcomic for the lead character in my video game, The Wizard's Den. The lead character is Daphne. Um, with any number of weird Huckleberry-like Barry last names, I haven't decided, but definitely Daphne is the first name. And Daphne is inspired by Strawberry Shortcake, because the whole game is kind of a love letter to my wife. Here's one of my wife's Strawberry Shortcake dolls, which I'm using for reference as I try to model Daphne in Maya. Um, but anyway, it occurred to me that I've got a lot of stuff going on with that game, but there's not a lot of humor, and um, I have some cool fantasy twists in the story of the game, but it doesn't feel very fleshed out. And so I just thought, oh, webcomics, I need to make more webcomics, it's been a while. And why don't I challenge myself to tell stories with Daphne and flesh out that universe? You know, side effect, if I come up with a bunch of cool fantasy stories that just make the whole world feel more lived in, that's a big win, actually. So that's my plan. So far, I uh, don't have a lot of great ideas for stories. I want comedy, because yeah, comedy always works. And a comedy about a small little, well, what's the term for that? Alchemist's creation slash pygmy. There's a term for a little creation in a test tube that alchemists were good at making. Shit. Um, Daphne's a little, little feisty girl slash elf slash wizard in training. And she's pretty much trapped inside the wizard's den and messing around with magical and alchemical, 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 um, artifacts. So there's, there's room for adventure. Right now, I just have the hefty idea that um, maybe she'll have a lot, she'll treat the alchemist or like her dad, and that way I can tell stories about my own dad, who's kind of getting old, and may have the senility. So not a lot of humor there, unless I get really dark and angry, uh, and that's all I got. So in theory, I could work in a lot of rad super fantasy twists, but I haven't thought of any. So so far, not going well, but that's why I got a week. So hopefully, uh, next week I'll have a Daphne webcomic. Yo!